I'm Jacob Kenny. And I'm Liam McPherson. It's the newest edition of Chris Rock's favorite podcast. With slaps. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! It's Speech, Speech from, the, from throne. the Throne. Oh, brother. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest from the Halls of Power. But not with another Oscars meme. We're just here to argue. Hey, Jacob, what are we talking about today? Well, last week, Liam, the number one piece of news was, of course, you being diagnosed with COVID. But the second oh, yeah, most that. challenging and most influential piece of news media that hit uh, the national psyche was the Nightmare Coalition, this supply and confidence motion uh, announced between the NDP and the Liberals. The ultra-left. Oh, they're back at it again. (laughs) I thought they were defeated in the 90s. It seems they made a comeback somehow. So within seconds of this uh, news breaking, we had the conservative interim leader, Candace Bergen, uh, attacking this secret backroom backroom negotiations that led to uh, Canada's first NDP government. Now, I think the easy criticism here would uh, just be pointing out uh, the absurdity of this statement. You have the the Conservatives have also uh, conducted their own backroom negotiations in minority parliaments. Uh, Exactly. They're also wantingly mislabeling uh, the situation. They're calling what is a a simple supply and confidence agreement a coalition, which it is not. Um, Exactly. So it's it's bad faith argument built on bad faith argument. But instead, I'd actually like to focus on the criticism that uh, I've seen in recent days coming from Trudeau's own caucus. Particularly, and I'm guessing here because uh, his caucus members are too afraid to to put uh, their names to their statements, but it seems it's the the more right wing elements of his caucus who are getting frustrated that they were not consulted about this deal uh, beforehand, and and they're essentially making the same sort of uh, backroom negotiation criticism that you see the conservatives making as well. Um, now I, I think there's a lot of reason why Trudeau and, and uh, his PMO would be wary of consulting uh, the caucus beforehand. Uh, They obviously did Mm -hmm. not want this information to leak. It seemed that it did leak in the first few months after this election when the NDP and Liberals started this discussion. It It was leaked to the media. That sort of put the deal on the back burner for quite a while uh, before this got renegotiated. But I think that besides just preventing from leaks, you know, you have worked with N- MPs. I've worked with MPs. We both know them. They're they're smart people, but they're not the smartest people. Like, there's a lot of MPs. Um, well, I don't know. In the case of my member, I I, I speak quite highly of my member. But, but you you keep going. But I'll but I'll explain I'll explain why. Even but the, you keep going. Even the smartest MP in the world, they might think they're uh, an expert on something, uh, but you'll you'll certainly find someone who's more of an expert in whatever field they've studied in. MPs are experts in one thing, and that's politics. They're not experts in policy, no matter how much they, they think they are. And maybe there's, a few, um, th- maybe there's a few brilliant people in there, but the average MP that I've met is more or less a meat puppet for uh, the leader. They're just there to... Uh, basically elaborate the party position that's already been chosen. They sit in the House of Commons. They stand up when they're asked to. They say what they're expected to say. And uh, that's about it. I see the point you're making. And to be honest, I think that us as constituents would be annoyed if we had MPs that acted in any different way. Like the whole reason of parties is that we want MPs who are uh, going to take a consistent line of view in the House of Commons. If we elected an MP, they sat in the Parliament and they just heard a really good speech from uh, the opposition and they suddenly decided to change their mind on everything that they had been running for in the election, I think we as constituents would be quite angry about that. Sort of the whole point of having a party is we know what our MP is going to, what position our MP is going to be taking the vast majority of the time. 
And so and people have demanded by elections when MPs have crossed the floor. Oh, exactly. There's been, exactly. It's angry constituents. So for sure. I sort of the 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 the, the Trudeau's caucus and the and the conservative criticism that this is taking place behind closed doors that there isn't public debate, I think is a really silly criticism because public debate in parliament has no purpose. It's party members who are speaking to one another. No one can be persuaded by any argument that's being put forth. And if they were persuaded, the public would be angry that they're persuaded. We want people to be voting in a consistent manner to have the party stay in rank. Uh, right. So it's a it's a it's a waste of time to be having these debates, and we see how parties treat them. It's it's uh, it's used as a few seconds to be put in a in a Twitter reel, or it's a it's a, a gotcha moment that's going to lead the the newscast. There's never any substantive issue that's that's being discussed that's that's going to actually change people's minds. Um. Everybody wants to get in that good quip. Well, and, and more importantly, we have to it's think of what Parliament is and what it was designed to do. Like, I I imagine there probably was a time in the distant past where you could have a group of 300 people that were relatively intelligent or smarter than the average person in their society, and they would have an open debate, and they could discuss the decisions that uh, their nation was undergoing. But that only works in a, in a medieval society where parliament was was working where the the government is really small and there's a very small number of policies the government can realistically enact in a very large and sophisticated society like our own uh it doesn't really make sense that an mp who only has six to eight members on their staff total is ever going to know enough to take a uh a legitimate position for themselves on every policy issue that's going to cross their desk. They're going to require either the resources of their party and the party research bureau, or if they're in government, they can access hundreds of thousands of public servants um, who can also provide them with good policy advice. Just as an individual member, they're not smart enough. They're just not smart enough uh, to and no human being as themselves and with only six to eight people working under them is ever going to be uh, omniscient enough to take a meaningful stance. So this is, this is the part I disagree with, but continue. Yeah, so, so I think the public should be celebrating these types of agreements or even coalition governments because uh, I think this backroom negotiation is actually the only way that parliament – is ever going to accomplish any meaningful part, uh, policy goal. And in fact, I'd like to move farther in this direction where we'd have a corporate shareholder model um, where each party essentially gets a share of the government based on their total vote or their, their, their seats, depending on the electoral mode. And it's just the party leaders who are having these discussions. And um, rather than trading their MPs like they do right now as, as meat puppets, as I said, um, they're just they're just trading like you would as with percentages of, of stock in a in a company, and and they're using only their party resources. I think that when you um, when you treat MPs like meat puppets, but MPs are self-aggrandizing individuals who don't want to be meat puppets, we get this really confusing um, mixture of you know the the leaders have to pretend like they care about what their mps think when they also have to ignore what their mps think to get anything done see i feel like viewers i feel like our viewers i mean <laughs> listeners are probably picturing like a bunch of popsicle sticks with sausages hanging off them and, in the shape of a and person that's what they are like you have to think and of what's i the, don't know if that's entirely no, true but even even if they aren't like you have to think the average mp you know, uh, they're more they're more white than the than the nation on average. They're more male than the nation, way more male than the way sure. nation on average, and older than the nation on average. Is this a sure. is this a group of people that we uh, want to be um, giving more power to when they whine about it, or should we actually be trying to uh, accomplish real policies rather than just giving all these old guys more speaking time? I think that's that's more or less the the argument that that I'm going. We and I'll, I'm I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on that. Well, so now listen, you make a number of good points. Now, first off, 
absolutely this paranoia and this hysteria about like the end of democracy because for the I think the fourth time in our not definitely not the fourth time but fourth time in, in the past 40 years we've seen a confidence and supply agreement this is the first time at the federal level I believe the fourth time in the past 30 I'd have to fact check that though listeners um, so don't uh, harass me on Twitter for that but uh, basically the confidence and supply agreement allows the government the federal government to, to function for a longer period of time as long as the federal government fulfills a number of priorities from the partner party. Um, but you can't even really call it a partner party because it's not like a coalition government where members of that smaller party sit in government. Like you're not going to see members of the NDP, MPs in the NDP becoming cabinet ministers. That's not what's going to happen. It's more like what we saw in BC where if you remember in 2017, the BC election was very, very close. Uh, so Christy Clark, I believe Christy Clark and the liberals who are basically conservatives in BC, uh, like they're very right wing. Uh, they won 44 seats. John Horgan's NDP won 43. And I believe Andrew Weaver's green party won two or three seats. Three, three I can't seats. remember three seats. So they, they held the, the balance of power and John Horgan basically said to, um, Andrew Weaver, do you want to prop me up? I'll ask the lieutenant governor, that's that's the governor general at the provincial level, um, I'll ask the lieutenant governor if I can form government instead of Clark's liberals because no one's going to sit in power with Clark's liberals to allow them to, to hold government. And that's what happened, and that has precedent in Ontario. Um, David, Pete, David Peterson, that's how he beat Bill Davis, who had been in power for, I, I believe, 40 years or something. Not, crazy not him personally, that, or, but no. the PCs sorry, sorry, have sorry, been in PCs. power for about 40 years at that, that point. That's yeah. right, that's right, the PCs. But he was in power for, like, I want to say almost 20 years. Yeah, he was, like he was quite, in there for a while, yeah. Quite a long time, quite a long time. And so anyway, so all I'm saying is this has precedent. It's not like some anti-democratic or undemocratic sub subversive action that like the Tories are, are trying to make it sound. It's it, That's just like hysterical BS that they know will rile up their base. That's red meat uh, for their base. It, it has no basis. And they know that. They all know better. Uh, and it's rich seeing Harper era MPs go off about that when, as Jacob mentioned, um, you know, there were there were machinations behind the scenes in 2004 uh, or, or five uh, between the opposition parties, including Stephen Harper, who said that he would sit in power if the Martin government fell. He would happily he would happily sit in power. And so, like, this was this was a plan that those MPs would have become aware of at some point if they didn't know directly at the time they would have found out about it or known about it and kept their mouths shut. You know, so it's just it's just hypocrisy. It's it's BS. Um, but I think where where you lost me was you know. So when I said my member that he's a great MP, I didn't necessarily mean like the MP for this riding. I met like my MP that I worked for on the Hill, Terry Beach. He's the MP for Burnaby North Seymour in British Columbia, and um, he likely, to be honest, he likely never will make cabinet, not because he's not a good MP, but because he was one of a handful of MPs that voted against the government on the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Uh, and he, you know, deliberated and deliberated because of course, you know, it is taboo in Canadian politics to break from your caucus. So he deliberated and deliberated and he consulted and blah, 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 blah. And like, you know, everybody consults quote unquote, like it's not necessarily anything special, but he, basically put out this like 10 page communique explaining why he was voting against it. And one of the reasons he cited was, you know, the, the, the local indigenous community was against it and he wanted to like meaningfully honor their wishes. And so I thought that was like cool. Cause you know, like how even the liberal government for all their talk of reconciliation can steamroll some of those goals, uh, and get in the way of that. But he, you know, pub very probably stated that his reason, one of his main reasons was that, uh, and I respect that a lot. And even the prime minister said he respected uh, Terry Beach's stance because the other liberal MP that was against it in the region, like he just said, I'm against it. He didn't really like, qualify why. Whereas Terry like put out a very detailed communique explaining why. And it was a big issue in, in our office. Like that was one of the, the hot files. And he just, you know, like, and so, you know, maybe he didn't, meaningfully accomplish anything like i guess that pipeline isn't going through but that's more because of bureaucratic decay more than anything else or bureaucratic delay um but 
I, I respect that because it, it, you know, he wasn't just going to toe the line on that thing. And he realized that that it potentially could have cost him a cabinet position and he didn't let his ego get in the way of that. Then you have, you know, the Nathaniel Erskine Smiths who like are a level deeper where they often have independent decisions and criticize the government, which is actually quite normal in our, our over in Britain, our friends in Britain, uh, you know, they, their parliament is very similar to ours, except for the fact that there are numerous government MPs that, you know, openly critique and hold the government to account. So I think MPs that are brave enough to do that and get away with it, I respect. But there there certainly are a lot of clapping seals. But to say that individual MPs can't band together and do something is nonsense. You know, it was, it was individual backbencher, nobody MPs that created the Bloc Québécois of three, carved them out of three different parties uh, to become a massive party because they all decided to take action. And yes, it took a hot button issue to do that, but it, it did happen. Um, so to say that they're sort of a non-factor is, is also wrong, but to say that they're, they're easily dismissed in terms of strategic direction for the government of the day, you are right. So I do agree there. Well, let's just cut, let's just cut you off there, Liam, because I think that your, uh, argument that there are 50 to a hundred people who are, who are good, so we should keep them there. I, I, I suppose my response would be, you know, why should we, why should those 50 or a hundred people um, who are there that are good, why should they only represent um, 100,000 constituents? Why can they not be shared amongst the whole population and have us uh, you know, cut out the fat? Now, there's... Th because there's no way for the population to remove them. That's where it well, gets tricky. Well, yeah, it is. It's called a general election. It's just that it's, it's just, you have to have more than 100,000 people. It's, it's 38 million people voting, but I don't see any substantial difference. It's like... Besides a by-election, the, the whole country is usually always voting in a general election. And I, I think this accountability problem is probably where I, I, I actually find this uh, representation model the most distasteful. Because one of the number one reasons I, I see consistently cited when I worked at the constituency office myself, um, the reason why people are using their MPs is as a conduit to a, a non-responsive and ineffective um, public service. So they've they've gone through the the hoops of the public service. They can't get anything. So they ask their MP or their MPP or their MLA to personally uh, intervene in the system. And I I actually think that's a little I, I find it disgusting to be quite frankly because it essentially allows uh, for an opportunity where an MP can move someone. Uh, to the front of the queue if they feel like giving someone a privilege. And I have been in conversations in um, constituency offices where there were people that were quite o openly trying to bribe me. I mean, they obviously didn't know that I was a student, that I, I had nothing that I could possibly give them in, in, re in real terms. But I, I was in many occasions... People were asking me, like, how much money do I need to donate to the Liberal Party? Or how much money do I need to give you in order to get to the front of the queue in some ministry or whatever? And, of course, they'd be like, that's not how it works. But that's Jesus. how the public thinks it works. And to be honest... But is that a civics failure or is that on MPs? You know what I mean? No, like, but, that's but the fallacy of your argument, it's, though. It's... it's, it's it's ha that sounds that, that like a person civics is, failure. That person, the, the, the people that are offering bribes, they're not... Um, they're only half wrong. Because from what I saw in constituency offices is that people from certain constituencies, from uh, particular demographics or from particular community organizations that the MP liked personally would uh, be would find themselves more helped by our system than those but do you think who that's did gonna not change though when you look at the data pie though like let's say we let's let's eliminate ridings here for a second like let's say we go with your model where it's sure it's, the public gets to vote in the general but it's list party guys let's say that they're looking at at the you know the liberal research bureau or they're looking at you know like whatever it is that they're looking at their database yeah um of of and they're looking at the pie and they're like oh you know in this writing, which we need to hold, or if we start losing writings like this, we know we're going to start to lose the election. 40% of the people there are from this demographic. Let's introduce this micro-targeted policy or let's 
uh, even, you know, let's put two hundred thousand more dollars towards the campaign in this writing. Like, do you, do you think that that's going to change? No like, one... You know, do you know what I mean? Like, if it's not the individual MP favoring somebody, it's going to be the party favoring a certain yeah, there's, demographic. There's like, that's no, just going to manifest there's, itself if there's somewhere no else. Representative, there's no one to whom the public can complain at that point. That they're uh... sure they can. In the general, they can throw the bums out. No, well, exactly. Like that's fine. I mean, I'm I meant more like. Um, there's no constituency office where you, you're going to get the randos that are going there. Like it seems to me that um, that MPs are M, MPs offices are a sort of charity where people that are not getting uh, responses from the uh, proper uh, official channels are using their MPs as a last resort uh, to have their case heard, and it it seems like a bit of a failure of our system that we sh we're we're spending a little too much attention um, at the constituency level when we should be focusing on fixing a public service that is just not very responsive to the public for whom it should serve, right? Like, that's that's where I'm saying we should be, that, like, and, um, and I think MPs who are very good at... Um, at solving individual problems for the constituents end up staying in those positions and that's why they are the the type of people you were describing that the ones that are become a hallmark of the or sorry a hallmark of, of their uh, community uh, it's because they can they can they can deal in favors but like that's maybe very useful for the hundred thousand people that live in that riding but i i don't think that's necessarily helpful for the nation of 38 million people that is canada like it's um you know we can't guarantee that all 338 um, MPs are going to have that same level of service. And so you're just sort of randomly sprinkling who gets to have access to the public service and who doesn't. And that's, that just seems really oh, sure. weird. The, but me. the principle of that, I, I guess, I guess that's the fallacy of your argument. In my opinion is like, if this is about like a, a civics, not a, a civics failure in terms of education, but like a civil service failure, um, then I think you're right on the money. Like, if that's the true root of your argument, I think you're right on the money. But where I think your argument goes awry is taking that out on people's ability to respond at, you know, to, to um, have a say at the local level about who it is representing them. Because if you take away that local say, then the only say people have is in the general election. And sh you're absolutely right that there are a lot of, like, listen, I worked in a a parliamentary office, which isn't a constituency office, but we did get some nutty stuff as exactly. well. Exactly, like there they are a lot get of li but, and, no, but wait, but wait, but wait. So there, so you're right. So there are a lot of nut jobs, but there are are also like people who maybe like genuinely need the help, and they they don't know how to access certain services. Like maybe they're a new immigrant, and maybe they're from a town that doesn't have that. You know. Oh, CISO, like they have in Ottawa, the Ottawa Community Immigrant Services Organization. It's a fantastic organization, but they don't have that like in, in small town Nova Scotia. So maybe they call up Sean Fraser yeah. and Sean Fraser can help them navigate the system. Like I think I think at the for somebody who, you know, like you say, oh, they can call a number, but like immigrants might not even know that. They're like, ah, shit, you know, we need to find a local representative and someone can at least point them to Sean Fraser's office. You know what I mean? I, so, I, like, when you're removing that principle from people and you're going, oh, people are using it to, to queue jump, and you're absolutely right that some people are, are trying to use it to their own advantage, and, and I'm sure that guy did try to bribe you. Like, I believe you. I believe that that happens. Um, but, but like, if you take that away and it's all about the old boys and the data that the old boys are seeing and what's important for the data to get the right data and the micro targets and, and the numbers – that that's there's going to be slices of that pie that get certain benefits because they're they're important strategically like that's there there's always going to be some form of of q jumping no i totally agree with that but i would rather i i i would much rather see it in a in a properly working democratic society the people that are getting q that that are getting q jumped are the class of people that are most important to the uh the nation overall rather than just being randomly distributed across the country based off of what weirdo happens to uh hold elected office in your in your constituency and if there's a genuine need for you know uh a, a q jumping representative or someone someone that you can talk to in order to have your case uh, heard by the public service, then maybe we can have each riding can elect like a, a public service representative for the uh, 
for the government because that, that seems to be the only real service of any value that I ever see MPs actually um, producing is, is that one-on-one. -on -one, uh, so maybe they can be like a customer service representative is, is, is what I'm suggesting. But when it comes to the the actual debate in the House of Commons, like it's it's pointless. There's, no one's going to change their mind. And, you know, MPs themselves will all, if you meet them, they tell you that they they spend most of their time and effort thinking about committees, which is by definition almost always the backroom deals that the conservatives mm -hmm. hate and uh, or hate all of a sudden, or it's it's working with constituency offices. Yet our politics focuses on the debate. That's it's a it's a really strange um, obsession with stuff that just doesn't matter. Like the, the 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 lines that are leading the news is not what the MPs themselves actually think is oh, sure. important. It's just and PMO it's really trying to weird. get a good sound bite. Yeah, exactly. So I, I agree. I agree there. But do you think that's going to change if you have a bunch of party list guys? Do you think who do you think the government's going to send out when they want a bunch of word salads when, in them? They're going to send out the said, party list guys. I never said party list. I I said I said that we should have entirely backroom deal governments. That I don't think there well, should be. That's even be. worse. Why not? What's the public supposed to think then? I don't care what the public thinks. The public can talk yeah, every four to cares. five years. Do you think the public's going to like the that? The public is idiots, man. The, like, just talk to every person that I've ever met is a is a nut job in some way or not. There's no one. Uh, if the public wants to say, they can talk every four to five years when there's an election, and then after that they can shut the hell up. Like that's no one has well, anything of that, value. Well, that to, doesn't that doesn't that doesn't win elections. That does that that doesn't like. That's not that's not electable. What are you electing? Okay, we'll go make the all all, all the decisions. Man, that's then how, you'll know nothing that's about how it. government used to work until uh, right. We it was, were it was become the case drinking buddies, as you said. As I said, but uh, that is government that actually got things done. Now we have government that's obsessed with messaging because people want to be hearing from their leaders rather than seeing action from their leaders for for some weird reason. And I, I think we've just the focus is all completely wrong. We should be electing leaders who are doing stuff, who are, who are actually um, making the world a better place. Instead, we're uh, electing leaders who sit in the House of Commons, giving speeches that no one listens to, who are like one-on-one -on -one helping a, some whatever random constituent runs into their office telling them a sob story, rather than electing uh, leaders who have a legitimate mandate, who are wanting to enact a vision for uh, our country. And that's sort of the, the problem that I have with this whole system. If you need, a, if you need people to um, interact with constituents so that uh, they can get a response from the federal government, fine. Elect a different class of people to do that. Uh, but well, that when you're simple. talking about, it is that simple. Like, if you take the right, the right of election away, it's no, simple. Oh, but then that I'm takes away saying, the I'm accountability. I'm not saying taking over the right of election away. I'm saying you should but have direct election at the local level is what I mean. Well, there's lots of, but as there's lots of countries that don't have it. So, and they don't. They're not like countries that are falling apart like most of Europe. There's is countries that have a mix. There's countries, yeah. that, and there might be countries that totally don't have it, but I know for a fact there's many that have a mixed member yeah, and, proportional representation system, mm -hmm. so they'll have some party list members, but I, some at the local level. I, I, I'm okay with something like also, that. Uh, the, the obsession with but, regionalism in Canada is also really dangerous uh, for our democracy overall. Like the, it the has idea, been historically uh, the, re, the, 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 the regional I, tensions. Yeah, exactly, I agree the there. idea that people in Alberta have different interests from uh, people in Ontario. Maybe that's true on the ground, but it's something we need to very rapidly uh, evolve away from, because uh, people in Alberta and people in Ontario are both going to find themselves very dead in a few years if all of you know plant life and uh, biological life on Earth is ended. Uh, from through climate change, so like we have way way bigger issues to be dealing with than whatever some rando in uh, Lacombe uh, in Red Deer Lacombe uh, wants to yell at Blaine Calkins, right? So why are we focusing on that? That's I think that's that that's sort of my uh, my issue with the whole system. We need um, we need systems that are capable of thinking on a way bigger scale than uh, we are right now. And I was just doing some some math uh, beforehand. Like if we, uh, an MP, they represent about 100,000 people, right? 
now they have on average a staff of, of six to eight people. So I thought, okay, what's a city I know that has 100,000 people? So I looked at Red Deer, that where I used to grow up, or, or around where I grew up. They also have a, a population of 1,000 people. But the, that was preferred Blue Deer, the, yeah, thank for the you. record. The mayor of Red Deer, um, they have, in their organizational chart, it looks to me, 17 direct reports. And each of those 17 people have their own teams who are giving them information. So the mayor of the city of the same size as the average constituency has 17 people whose only job is to provide him with information and teams of people working on those 17 people. Whereas the average MP has six to eight people total working under him. And the range of policy possibilities that's available to the an, an MP or is much, much greater than the range of policy uh, alternatives that's available to a mayor. So why is it that that it's uh, the mayor is the one that's given way more resources? I think it's because we are well aware that the mayor is much much more important to the lives of their constituents than the than the MP is. And we just okay, need I to agree sort with of that, but then you're just then that's a jurisdictional point though, right? We need to respond appropriately now. Like why do we have this that's person? That's just a jurisdictional qualm. Right, because that's all. That's always been the way it works. Of course, the mayor's going to have more direct say over where you can park in Halifax and, like, what you know, what what can be, what are the protest no, laws, what are the laws on settlements I'm more talking for, about for the, unhoused people. Who are the, 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 like, the, the, that's all municipal. But then the province enters into that, and they're less useful, but still useful somewhat at the local level. And then when you get to the federal level, they're not really as useful at the local level. But it's still important that you have that local representation as a means of accountability. There's, well, That's the, what I the keep point I'm back trying to. to make is that when a person is making decisions, they need to hire a staff that can give them information so that they can make those decisions in an in an informed way. Okay. In order for a, in order for a mayor of the same level of city uh, uh, as the Irish constituency to make qualified decisions, he needs a way bigger staff than the than the MP. So who where's the lie? Where's the where's the waste? Is what I'm is what I'm trying to ask here. Like the you're, M you're comparing, the MPs you're comparing want... two different systems of government, though. Oh, yeah, it's it's apples and oranges, I guess, a, a little bit. But I don't really understand why uh, municipal government is infinitely more complex than uh, a federal a federal government is. Like, why 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 is this the the case? Now you it's can make an argument. Complex. You can make an argument that MPs uh, should have a much larger staff so that each of them individually can actually have enough information to. Um, make informed decisions but i don't think the public is willing to spend anywhere near that amount of money uh to see that happen and you know if we want to eventually i think we're going to be basically building a decentralized public service at that point because you almost need an entire public service to get enough uh, information for an mp to make an informed decision these guys are not experts on things so uh, your your point about this being a public service failure, like I think that's a great point because there has been a public service failure on on some some levels. I think, um, particularly in in some some departments, in some cases, there's kind of a either hidden or open sort of resentment of access to information, where it's every exemption possible under the list you know, to, to redact something like the, every, every exemption that they can, they can use, they will. And the reason I know this is because I, I, I know or know of, or follow on social media, a lot of journalists who have had to try to go through the access to information system and they'll, you know, just to get information about something the government was involved in. And, you know, it's a basic tenet of transparency, but a lot of governments, it's either second thought or complete waste of time and they just don't do it. And so they do everything. It's almost cont contemptuous where, you know, you request something like about some case or some meeting, some meeting, some call. Um, and these aren't files I've seen, by the way. These are like files, like I wouldn't talk about any files I've seen. These are files that are public record that have been pulled from access to information by journalists, by the way. Um, and and they're all redacted and like maybe it was about a, like a phone call between like a senior public servant and a less senior public servant 
about some arcane thing and it's all redacted for like reasons of security and like it's like you know the information is not going to compromise security like it's it and so they you can file a, an appeal like you can file a grievance basically and they go okay and then they take you know months to get back to you on that so it's already been months you get the thing it's all blacked out sometimes it's years that one or two years it's all blacked out you file a grievance uh and then it, it it's it bounces around the system for a few months, many months, maybe another year or two even. Uh, oh, okay, here here it is. Or sometimes it'll be even worse. Sometimes it'll be like you'll request a thing and they'll be like, oh, we don't have the thing. And you're like, we, we, we know you have the thing. Like one time there was one journalist that like it was something that like partial, was already partially public record. <laughs> and they're like, oh, we don't have the thing. And he's like, I know you have the thing. And he filed a grievance. And they're like, oh, we have the thing. And they redacted it all. And then he filed another grievance and was like, this thing, I know you have the thing, it's all redacted, you're not supposed to do that under, this, under these exemptions. Lodged well, another grievance, bounced around the system some more, and then it came out again, uh, but, it, but it was like significantly less, less redacted, like there were only a handful of things redacted. But this was after like three or four years. Like there's like journalists who are waiting for things three or four years long after they're of any use to them. That's the most hilarious part is they, they file it for a story that they're writing that they think will get done in a few months and they'll get it long after it's any use to them. Um, and they'll still publish it like for the public record. Cause like that's part of their, some of them feel like it's part of their job, like to publish things like that. Like here, you know, I got hold of this a tip here. It is, you know, it's public record now. Um, but it's just, it's just hilarious and, and a testament of how broken that, part of, I think, bureaucracy is in Canada. Uh, and you're absolutely right that, that that's something that needs fixing. And, and like, there, there are certainly ways that we can look at improving that. Like, I don't agree with that principle. I think I agree with the, I disagree with the way you're, you're going about it. So this is what I look for in a leader. I, I'm not interested in someone that's going to uh, give me televised addresses or make Instagram posts or kiss babies or, you know, blow donors or whatever it is that the average. Well, sure, that's all theatrics. I, I want to elect a leader who's going to get shit done. That is my only sure. goal. And when I'm looking for people to support, I'm looking for the type of people that I know are going to do that. And I know there's only so many hours in a day. And if you're spending all your time, uh, you know, chatting with whatever random person walks in your office, there's less time for you to be getting stuff done for the country. So. Um, you know, we can talk about uh, uh, public transparency and all that uh, as much as you want. I actually am more in the Kim Campbell school of this, where <clears throat> she said an election is not a time to talk about policy. I 100% I agree with her, <laughs> even though that was a, a famous slip wrong. of the tongue. I think that, I think that politics wrong. should be about values, and we should be, as a public, uh, evaluating leaders not based on their policies because again they're idiots they don't know anything about policy and no one person can possibly know about everything the government does the government does too many sure. things well, well, it's, of it's course. not possible I, for a person I, you to be educated. you and i don't know no, everything no, the government no, does. no never so what we should be doing instead is evaluating what are a person's and a party's values what do they care about and do they reflect what i as a person care about and the more we make it about um policy discussions the less that we can have uh, an intelligent conversation uh we can have a pretend intelligent conversation because of what we've read in the in, in the newspaper but you know even uh, media stories only ever scratch the surface of all the nuance and, and implications of of even the tiniest policies that are going to pass um our leaders desks so what i think we should be doing instead is selecting good leaders not trying to hamstring them with whatever policies um we think in our stupid heads uh might be the best for the country we should be electing leaders who can find good policy advice and then determine what is is best for the country and if after four years or five years we don't like where they're going then we'll uh or we think that they're out of step with with our values, we can select new ones. That's why I, I just don't care about you know um, uh, uh, whether uh, policy documents are being presented to the public or whether debates are being had in public. Like I, I think that's just less time for governing. Essentially, it's it's, it's theatrics. It's not uh, any sort of objective that's that's being uh, achieved there. And uh, I'm much more interested 
in having a government that uh, is is just a, a bunch of people smoking cigars or whatever they do and uh, able to, to, to meet quickly, negotiate quickly, and then leave the room and implement whatever um, – they've agreed to rather than Old boys club. rather than a bunch of uh, people that are endlessly discussing the same thing over and over and over again and, and getting nowhere even if the doors are open i'd much prefer them to do something rather than to just talk about it all day this segue is going to shock you <laughs> but do you know within the certain within the current confines of our system do you know what gets shit done this current agreement in exactly. my opinion yeah. That's where I agree with you. That's within the confines of our system. It makes complete sense. We're progressive. We obviously like it. I think most progressive voters, unless they're hyper-partisan, are somewhat happy about this agreement or like maybe la slightly less apathetic than they were, at least for now, um, because it guarantees likely – you know, it, it guarantees a higher success rate for important policies – like the full implementation of child care, Ontario signed their, the, the deal today, which is great. That's not because of the agreement like that was in the works, but like ro the rollout of that, they'll be held to account because that's a key priority. Dental care uh, is, is a key priority for the NDP for lower income people. Uh, I believe it's kids uh, as well. Uh, and, and I, you know, we'll see if Trudeau kind of tries to fight him on the scope of that, like oh, only for lower income or only for kids under this age or whatever see if they, they try to quarrel with it i don't imagine they really will because it's the ndp sort of already like i mean maybe maybe those discussions were already had because they already come came out and said only for this specific subset um so I, I can't see why they wouldn't be able to get that done and then the other key priority they want done is pharmacare uh, because the liberals, for some bizarre reason, have never even tried. Though we it just before. had the biggest health crisis of our lifetimes, <laughs> been dragging their feet yeah. on implementing pharmacare, which has been a perennial promise of liberals since yes, Jean Chrétien's Red Book in 1993. Uh, it's, the, it's this perennial thing. Dental care has been tossed around. Uh, child care has been tossed around most recently since Paul Martin's uh, child care agreement that was scuttled when when the 2006 election was called. So it's, it's, you know, it's going to guarantee progress, substantive progress on three important policies for a social Democrat like myself, uh, which is what I've come to realize I am. Uh, and that doesn't mean I'm NDP. I, I don't have a really a partisan affiliation right now. Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Liberal Party member, but like I, I, you know, I don't know whether I will or remain or not. I haven't kind of made up my mind. I'm just sort of a transient progressive <laughs> at the moment but the, anyway i digress these are policies that are you know important to people like jacob and myself uh listeners and i think it, you know that that's why we personally like it i'm sure if i was a tory i'd have a different view on it um but any smart tory worth their salt who knows anything about how the house of commons works who knows anything about how our system of government works knows this is not a subversion of democracy as 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 Patrick Brown tried to frame it, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I have no idea how he's been able to uh, sort Get of have a rebirth, yeah. despite the fact that the allegations about him have not been refuted. It was details about the ages of one of the yeah. uh, <laughs> the, the, the alleged victims. Uh. Uh, and, and, and he's a guy and, that all of our friends who have worked so in the conservative just, party you know, he's on his high horse. Yeah. It's just made me laugh. Like every, and it, like we've, we, you and I know staffers in the, in the conservative party who work with Patrick Brown. It's a well-known fact on the, on the Hill that the guy's a creep. Like there's, it was an open, it's secret. An open secret. And uh, yeah, he's still somehow in the national conversation, but so, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't think anybody's taking lessons on subversive acts from him, no. you know, and, so I, I, anywho, uh, I, I think, I, I th you, you know, it makes sense for the country. I think this is the kind of thing that gets things done that allows us to stay within our current model of some control over who represents you, even whether they're a nut bar or not. Obviously, if they're a nut bar, you should try to get, please don't vote for nut bars and you should try to get as many nut bars as possible out. I'm not saying we, l let's stand with the nut bars guys. We're being too hard on them. I'm saying exactly the opposite. I'm just saying you know, this is under our system of, of government where we have a lever, we have a, a, a say and it's progress for the country. And I'm, I'm really happy about it, to be honest. It's, it's really good to see. It'll cement a lot of things that 
right now are kind of up in smoke a bit and that that in you know three years time four years time will will just be cemented parts of national policy that will be hard to strip away yeah um, not impossible but 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 unpopular to strip away so that i i'm happy to see this yeah and i i think if if there's a reason why the the conservatives seem to be uniformly um criticizing this deal i think it's because they realize that they have gone so far away from the political center of gravity in this country that um in their current form they'll never be able to attract another party to make such a supply and confidence arrangement with themselves like they've alienated themselves exactly. from any maybe the block sometimes because they've gone yeah, more the, the, the block maybe they used to be more progressive the, the, the block but, maybe could on some racist policy sure would be happy to to join with the conservatives mm. but that's pretty much the only thing like uh what i'm in i've been in rural yeah. quebec and like uh, voters there like they they dislike the conservatives just as much because even in rural quebec uh, they've moved on from uh, abortion they moved on from gay rights and they feel like the, unless you're in and around quebec city that's one sort of like powerhouse yeah, yeah, but e- even then, like, they're quebec. still a little more environmentalist as well than the than than the federal party is it seems the only thing that that conservative quebecers agree on with the um, conservatives the rest of sure. the country is uh a general dislike of uh non uh people <laughs> um yeah yeah so yeah so that's why i think the uh the Tories are so against this is because you know they they're focusing on that majority target because they realize that they have uh, moved so far away from the other parties in Parliament that they are never going to get uh, a deal like this. And it, and to be honest, even if the they did get a deal like this, it would come with with such compromises from what have become core conservative values that whatever leader signed a deal with the liberals signed a deal with the bq i don't know if they could ever sign a deal with the ndp but signed a deal with with them say they would they would be axed by their own caucus it seems like they just they'd have to compromise on so many things at this point that uh, and conservatives are conservative members are so far to the right now they wouldn't stand for it uh and it brings up an interesting conversation though because i think we're getting to the point where uh, the, I would say the one downside of possible downside of this, um, from a if, you know from a political spectrum standpoint, is there's an increasing amount of voters that you know we're we lean left, a lot of the conservatives lean right. There's an increasing amount of voters who I, identify as being in the center, uh, whether or not they truly are in the center. Like I'm sure some people identify as one thing and are aren't tr- are truly another thing. But there are a lot of people out there who I think swing between blue and red or have historically because they've been closer. Like I would say the 90s liberals and the, and the and even the Martin liberals and the Harper conservatives, the way they governed economically was very not similar. too different. Yeah. Honestly, very, very similar economic policy. People forget the federal the federal liberals until um, the late 2010s, early 20 or sorry, it's late 2000s, early 2010s were quite um, fiscally conservative. And there's an increasing amount of people that I think would like a party that is like the federal liberals were, that is fiscally conservative, but socially progressive. Uh, and I don't know how, what percentage of the electorate those people would make up, but I know it's more than 20%. And I know that if, if such an option existed, maybe they wouldn't be in contention for government, at least not right away, but they would certainly be a significant player I think the liberals under Trudeau have gone left, which I've agreed with that shift, but they've gone left. Uh, and as you and I were discussing privately earlier in the day, there's I was reading a Hill Times story uh, about the, the one I mentioned earlier about the liberal MPs anonymously complaining. And one of them have said the liberal the liberals have gone ultra left under Trudeau, which I thought was hilarious <laughs> because they absolutely have not. No. They've gone left. They haven't gone like, whoa, super like ultra radical left. Like that's just... That's just exaggeration uh, and and hysteria. Um, but that shows the perception of some liberals in the party, even sitting MPs that are more centrist, who would probably want to be in some sort of like progressive conservative or 90s liberal type party. I don't know what the name of the party would be. And I think they would join by people like Jean Charest and Patrick Brown and people from those that wing of the party. I think there's that they would make up a significant portion of the electorate that is fed up with 
where the federal conservatives are likely headed if Pierre Polyev succeeds and, and takes the helm of the party and fed up of where it's going under Trudeau. Uh, and, and I think that, I think that if the party, if the liberal party stays where it is under say a Freeland or a Jolie or an Anand or a future leader of the liberals, if it stays kind of left, Anand has stated she wants to be a little bit more fiscally conservative. She's sort of dropped hints that she's, but what does that really mean? So like, you know, if it stays substantively where it is and the Tories stay substantially to the right, that those people will get tired and there will, there will be some sort of center option that will become a player or a, or a kingmaker. Of I sorts. totally disagree with that perspective. Like I don't, I, I, oh, I really? actually, I, I think there is probably a segment of the, of the portion of the population that is as large as you describe it to be. But I don't think they uh, exist in any demo, um, any regionally concentrated way, and I, I think if they not enough to not enough to return to power, and not I enough to think. even elect MPs. To be honest, like uh, if you see what the PCs oh, were like true. before, if you see what the PCs were like um, before the merger um, with the Reform Party, like they did get fifteen twenty percent uh, sometimes in their elections, but they only elected ever a handful of, of MPs post. Um, Kim Campbell, because they were spread all over the place. Like that, I think right, the problem. Right, but you know is... why that is, though. Do you know why that was? Because the federal liberals were filling the void yeah. for that demographic. The federal liberals were fiscally conservative, and socially, at, for that time, yeah, but, socially progressive. But, you know, they passed gay fiscal, marriage, right? Fiscal conservatism in that time would would have covered like eighty percent of the population. Liam, like that was a that that was well, like oh sure, no, absolutely, a... like and and so and I'll, but I'll give you an example of, of uh, how you're right. So um, I, sp I spent from 2005 to 2016 living in Barrie, Ontario, uh, full time. And Eileen Carroll from 2005 to 2006 was my MP. When I, so when I first moved there, she was a liberal and she'd been elected since like the 90s. And the Canadian Alliance vote, with one exception, was never strong enough to win a seat. Um, with one notable exception, who was beaten by Eileen Carroll. And she was in, she was extremely popular because, like you said, there were a lot of fiscally conservative people uh, back then. But also, like, the PCs weren't a, a viable option because there was no visible daylight between them and the liberals. And the reform, so the reform became the conservative option for socially conservative people that would win seats. But there weren't enough of them to form government the old PCs were just kind of hanging around. So I can see how that was kind of different. Um, also because the federal, but, but I have to disagree because the federal liberals at that time were, were sort of a, a different tilt because what happened in 2006 is Eileen Carroll lost to the federal conservative party. And since, and Patrick Brown actually beat Eileen Carroll in 2006 and he was our MP for eight years. And since then it's been blue, 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 because there's enough fiscal conservatives who were, you know, socially maybe center or like center right, but even center left that were okay with voting conservative in Barry. Um, and they used to vote federal liberal. Now they voted conservative because that became a more viable option, but it's getting to the point now where it were, they were seeing openly the discontent in the Tories. And yes, it's not electorally substantive. Like they're not going to form, they're not going to become PM kind of like 15% of the population is going to elect PM kind of thing. But like we're seeing those, those members, those red Tory members complaining now openly for the first time. Like they're not quiet anymore. They felt reasonably uh, accommodated under Stephen Harper's party. But since Harper's gone out and these other guys have come in, if they've gone further to the right, these guys don't feel accommodated anymore. Uh, and there's people in the liberals on the liberal side of things to the, the right of that party that don't feel accommodated anymore. Um, so it's possible there could be some sort of a center or like rump. Like I'm not saying like a significant amount of seats, but a rump of a party enough to be influential in some but votes we, in a minority situation. We need to imagine what, which is significant. what is this party's, this, this centrist party, what is their message and is it going to let's resonate? balance the budget? Yeah, let's yeah, balance yeah, exactly. the budget while being socially progressive. Is it going to resonate with the world 
that is is coming up like we have it would certainly you know, resonate with swing voters okay, i will say that it, like, definitely so we, ontario swing voters would like but that we have for sure like, we, we have COVID still happening we have the potential for a war in europe we are having climate catastrophe there's uh, like there's oh, so agree. many places where you're saying. government is going to be needed and we're going to need more government than ever before and now I agree in, you're in saying, the middle you have of to this, picture how insular these people are right uh, you have to you have to picture and th- and this is this is I know you you grow up from a place that historically loads Ontario anyway yeah. but like I grew up in Barrie which is an hour uh, north of Toronto it's not officially GTA but like you get to the GTA in 30 minutes it's a 30 minute drive to York region 25 even if you probably if you speed <laughs> which don't speed but um you know like basically these people are, you know, so it's not that they don't, they're not caring people, but they're, it's insular, right? It's the suburbs. They're focused on saving for retirement and they're focused on what, what, how can I get, what credits can I get back on my taxes and like consumerist things like, Oh, can I get a tax? Can I get these boutique credits for this and this boutique credits for that? Which is why like, yes, you and I roast them all the time because they're terribly ineffective policy, but they sell these micro-targeted boutique tax credits, they love that stuff. And liberals and Tories have both done that. And I think a cent- the centrist option would. You can't win an election on that alone. But what I'm saying is, like, that, you know, one piece of the pie is they like those little bo- boutique things. But they're, it's insular, right? Like, you're in the burbs. You're not focused. Of course, you hear about the war in Ukraine and you think it's terrible. And maybe you put a flag up and stuff. Or maybe even donate. But, like, you're, you're ultimately focused on your life in the burbs and you're focused on the price of things going up and you're focused on real estate. And if you, if you are more to the center, which we are not, like, I don't think that the government is really pissing its pants. Um, like, it, it's definitely, like, spending a lot of money in response to a health crisis. And I understand that level of spending. But there are, there are, vo- there are voters who don't understand that level of spending who are going to eventually become uncomfortable and they'd rather see that money spent on them and their boutique things. That's well, kind of why I'm I, talking about the boutique things and they'd rather, you know, what's going to make my life better. Okay. Like that, that's sad or that's, that's concerning, but what's going to make my life better. And if they don't feel like the liberals or the conservatives are focusing on what makes their lives better. And I think they, I think this liberal NDP agreement will be helpful for making the liberals follow through for sure. But if the public perceives a failure to follow through and a failure to do things to make their lives better, and the Tories don't have any policies to make their lives better or a serious climate policy, which is or, or, or a, a policy that is perceived to be serious, then they'll throw them out. And there's a centrist option that's saying, listen, I'm socially progressive, but we need to rein it back a little bit. Here's and here's some more credits for you directed at you. And here's more like business oriented shit. I think there's a, a, a decent slice of the pie that would go towards that. Uh, I think you underestimate that and i think you underestimate the the apathy within both the tories and the liberals at this moment that could change but at this it's moment it's not that i time. underestimate that it exists i underestimate that it exists in enough concentration that it would ever elect someone and i think the problem is, oh, is that would. I like think these, it would totally all these elect boutique someone. promises they're useless if the public doesn't see it as a credible alternative like the when it comes with um rump parties that are able to um actually make kingmaker status it's like the block or it's like the reform where they they peeled off parts of other parties but they focused on a particular region of the country that they felt was being but, underserved but the center, by but the, the center existing. is a region though the center is not, not on a, the map it's not a region but it's but it doesn't it, no, matter it's not it a, it's if not it's not on the map it doesn't count in our system of government well that's no that's it, not that's not it true it's all about true. data like, now think of the ndp it's like pop, the, population the, 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 the population NDP, they can get a, a decent tranche of the uh, of the popular support but they never get it in enough of a place to ever be considered a, a real player so yeah there's a lot of people that consistently vote ndp no one no one could give less of a shit about them to be honest like this is the we didn't talk no, about oh we, i see what you're saying it's about, i see what you're we, saying it's about the concentration exactly. it's about the concentration i know no, i agree i agree i agree but but what i'm that the, the whole point that i'm making is of course it's about the concentration but you're again making an argument as if I think that this party would be ever anything more than ten to fifteen seats. Yeah, but like if, I, if the party's going to be nothing but ten to fifteen seats, no one's going to vote for it. I think they, I think that they would be able to cobble enough together, enough support together in certain ridings, like maybe ten to twenty ridings, uh, to get in. 
and and you're but and you're wrong to say that no one's going to vote for them. They're they're that's how a lot of things have started. That I think I believe the block. I mean, the block was a significant amount of MPs, but I think it was. It it, it couldn't have been. Uh, you know, I'm going to Google this because I don't want to. I, wanna, I, don't tw- say I this believe on... it was twelve of them. That that was it. Was together. it only twelve? So twelve, right? And then so twelve went went up astronomically, and then went back down, and it's gone up, and it's gone it went up, and then went down. Um, but that party really like it's only thirty ish years old. So like, which is that's a long time in my life because it's older than me. But like in in the political yeah. life of a country, that's not such a long but... time. And so, like, of course, the block will never. And I know you hate. I know you don't like the block. And I know, I know you, your problems with the block. And you can elaborate with that uh, on that after. But just let me make this point, which is that, you know, it it is possible even in our crappy, limiting first past the post system, which I don't like and think should be replaced. It is possible to elect a rump, and you could say, oh, the block have a nationalist cause. Exactly. So it's more potent, and for sure that's more more potent. But it's really not that potent these days, which is why they've lost seats at this point in time because that current that cause, the interest in that specific cause, has has waned. But and you're absolutely right that where these centrist people are distributed matters. But I do believe that there are more of them in more places in Ontario that currently switch between liberal and conservative that are valuable writings. Then you give credit. No, but the, to. this is. But that's where I disagree. This with is you. The, the type of politics so. that I, I think people sort of misunderstand a little bit because uh, in order for a party to get support, it needs to have a unique selling proposition. It can't just be. Oh, they need more than just, just boutique like, tax it, credits. It, no, no, I agree. It can't just be like, oh, I like a little bit of what these guys say, and I like a little bit of what these guys say. That's a problem with the NDP and the Greens. Uh, consistently have where they they give you sure. every single policy that you could ever possibly imagine that left wingers want, but sure. they give no sure. yeah. narrative, and so you're just and nothing with, to the center, with, Jacob. With either nothing, yeah. nothing to the center, though. But okay, just just think about like why does the why did the block succeed? Why did the reform succeed? And why does the NDP not succeed? It's because the block have a unique selling proposition in Quebec when they they formed it as a rump, but they were able to say something that none of the other parties could. Exactly the same with the with the reform. They had extremist views as well, the reform, but they they had a regional focus that none of the other parties did. A centrist party in Canada would not be saying anything remarkably different than the other parties are saying. Um, they would just be saying less of it, essentially. They would be like, we'll do a little bit of what the conservatives do, or we'll do a little bit of what the liberals want. And that's so freaking boring. No one will listen to that. You, if you well, have no, to, think, you'd have to create that's, your that's own the construction policy. Of the party that you're making up in your head, though, Jacob. Like, that's not necessarily, I think you're assuming that a centrist party is, when I say, oh, it's going to be, it's going to pull some people from the liberals and some people from the conservatives. I don't mean that it's like verbatim going to, like, I, I think you picture in your head it being this, like, creepy uniform, like, the, the guy walks out. I'm exaggerating here, just for comic effect. But you know, the guy walks out in a half blue, half red suit. Yeah, it's it's like, and then he he talks about balancing the budget, but also that Black Lives Matter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like I don't know, I don't know if it would be like quite as literal as your as your. It's thinking. like Lisa Rates head and Scott Bryson's legs, like. This <laughs> <laughs> so like like I don't know if it would be like quite, quite as literal as you as you say, but like but I take your point that it's it's less politically galvanizing than a cause like Quebec separatism was in the nineties exactly. for sure. I'm not comparing it to that. And the, the urgency isn't there, but I, I, I just, I, I just think that if the liberals and the conservatives like underestimate these people for better or worse, which I don't, I don't, I'm not saying they should listen to these people. I, I and I imagine they won't. And I imagine like those people will get fed up and then like people from the toys will get fed up and if there's enough of them, which there may not be, like I could be wrong. I could be right. Then the, if there's enough of them, they'll form a party or, or they'll break off and, and, and caucus together and go from there, like, which is, you know, which has been done. So we'll 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 have to see. We'll have to see. But I, I, I'm not saying like, oh, they're going to form government in five years. I'm not I'm not saying that or, or that they'll get any more than like 10 to 20 MPs. Like it'd probably be more like a rump Joe Clark type thing, at least at least at first until they developed an identity or if they managed to. No, I I think that our media environment just, it it prizes polarization way too highly to allow for a central alternative to exist. 
Yeah, like it's just it, it's not going to capture the uh, imagination and um, the attention that's necessary to to win a uh, popular contest uh, in, in an election in, in the 21st century. You need a unique selling proposition, and I'm just not sure what that would be. Like, if it's if it's balancing the budgets, well, you know the conservatives are going to say the same thing. If it's uh, social justice, you know the liberals are going to say the same thing. So I just don't really see what the message is that uh, a centrist party is going to give to voters that isn't being echoed by um, someone else. And if you're if there's if there's no message that you're saying that that's unique to you, if you're just saying I have the correct balance of everything. I don't find that particularly compelling, and I don't think that uh, most voters will find that uh, compelling either. And I even if, like, if people aren't stupid, they, they know in, in our system you need to have, uh, you need to, to have a plurality in order to win. If you live in a, in a riding where there's 30% really strong conservative voters there, and there's 20, 20, 25% really strong liberal voters there, um, are you really going to be convinced that uh, you know your your vote in the center is going to be a difference, or are you going to be pulled into the strategic voting discussions again, like the NDP always is? Like our, I don't know, our system just values that polarization too much to to have people massing in the center all at once. I think electorally, there need to be, in terms of our system, there need to be a, a significant change. To, to affect those variables in any significant way. And even if you did change the electoral system, we'd still have the polarization of our, of our social media, yeah. uh, which is, you know, to sum up what you just said. And, and, and with that, uh, I think we'll have to wrap it up for today. Uh, you know, you've heard us drone on enough, audience. We've, we've really just been boring you. In fact, wake up, wake <laughs> up. Hey, you've fallen asleep. And we should uh, tease uh, Liam. The reason why we didn't, f I, I focused more on talking about MPs and less about um, the deal was uh, between the NDP and the Liberals is because we have a special guest coming on in our next episode uh, from the NDP, who we, we will be discussing with, uh, laying out uh, the, the pros and cons and the future of the of the NDP and the progressive movement in Canada more generally. Yes, she's uh, so she's no longer with the federal party which is why she'll be interesting to have on and she'll be able to tell us about that but you can uh you can tune in next week viewers we'll we'll have a, a great show planned for you uh if you liked what you heard this show if you hated what you heard this show um if you have complaints if you have recipes if you have uh funny memes you can send them to speech from the throne at gmail.com that's speech from the throne at gmail.com uh and until then we will see you next week.